Hi everyone, it's me, Bree Blue Angel, back with another part of Call Me Under, the demo. I have been waiting to play this game all day, and I just want to jump right in. I'm really intrigued about this next part where um, Marie and Blue are going to go to the spot where Marie had the vision of Blue before in the atrium. I wonder what the commute time from Asphodel to, to the atrium. But yes, I'm very intrigued um, and I just need to know more answers, hopefully. I mean, I know we won't get all the answers since this is a demo after all, but I'm sure there will be more details that um, will at least hint us at something that's going on um, here in Styx. So, yes. Fine. Let's go. We're going. We're going. We're going. <laughs> Blue's legs are annoyingly long, and I'm finding it hard to keep up with him. He may in fact be 90% legs. The other 10% is probably nicotine. Of course, he's such a tall person. Tall man. And it's just, he's just legs. Legs for days, obviously. If I didn't know any better, I'd think he was trying to lose me, despite him being the one who asked me to take him to the scene of the vision. I suddenly regret telling him where it was. I'm pretty sure Penny would shoot me if she knew that I was doing what, was, what I was doing now. I push away the vision of her angry face and continue trying to follow Blue through the winding tunnels of Asphodel. We're heading to the crossroads, the place where all roads and sticks merge. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I bet the crossroads is um, an interesting intersection. He strides onward, arms swinging at his side, smoke from the cigarette he clutches like a lifeline, trailing behind him and hitting me in the face every ten steps. When he blows out the air, I'm sure. That's every ten steps. Keep up. I scoff, watching the end of his long coat swish around yet another corner, Blue disappearing out of sight for a few moments before I actually catch up with him. And then, as if out of thin air, a body appears and throws itself at Blue, pinning him up against the wall. Oh. Who is this? Oh. It's, it's Adrian. Wow, I, I love both of their hairstyles. Just like nice and wavy. Nice and wavy. I'm a sucker for wavy hair. He grunts, his head hitting the brick with a thud that makes me wince. But Blue simply blinks a few times before he's grinning, sizing up the person caging him. In, one palm laid flat against the brick at the, head of, the side of his head. The other curled in his shirt. I skid to a stop trying to process exactly what I'm seeing here, and then I realize I recognize the culprit. You don't forget a face like that. Very true. I do not forget this face. Adrian Navarre. Portraits. Fine art. Advertisements. The sweet, shy siren from the killing moon, not looking quite so sweet or shy. They stare blue down, their chest heaving where they try to catch their breath. Their jaw is tightly clenched, and I'm sure they're only a few seconds away from baring their sharp teeth at him if he keeps grinning at them like that. Maybe if they eat him, my dreams will stop. Much to consider. <laughs> I think that is a theory. If they do eat him, will, will Marie's dreams slash nightmares stop? I do wonder. You. It's... You. I. They inhale, their breath shaking and catching in their throat. You're real. I didn't think you were real. Blue, still grinning, still apparently harboring a huge fucking death wish, simply sighs. It's a condescending sound, one I'd personally like to punch him in the face for, so I can't imagine what Adrian must want to do to him. You look even prettier in person. Are we flirting, Blue, in this moment? You could die. I mean, I guess. Why not? Why not flirt? Um, flirt in the case of death. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
to be continued, guys. <laughs> guys, I literally just started this video. Mm-hmm. Wow. Didn't realize it was that short. I was so close to that. I should have just finished it the other day. Mm -hmm. I love this music, though. Yes, credits to all the lovely, lovely people. It is interesting, though, that Blue and Adrian have met at this point in time. See you soon, somewhere beyond the sea. Okay. Huh. Well, let me, let me think. Okay. So, that was good. Very interesting. But that is my role as a human. Um... And so I assume that picking a different character description slash background is going to yield a different demo. So I think that that's what I'll do. I will play the game some more and do it from the perspective of the Skia instead of the human. Um, I'm very intrigued. I can't believe Blue and Adrian met, but this also makes sense. Like the characters know each other. Um, but it also seems that Blue and Adrian don't know each other. Like, they've only just met recently because of visions, I'm assuming. Which is a very great cliffhanger, by the way. Um, so yes. <clears throat> Excuse me for my, uh, naivety with, uh, <laughs> not knowing that the demo was going to be close to being done last time. Um, but yeah, that's okay. There's more to do. So let's just continue on with that. Um, I wonder if I'll like more of the human demo or the Skia demo, just based on like what kind of plot comes out. Um, but yeah, let's see. Let's do a new game then. We got a warning. Can we, can we skip? Okay, we're skipping because we already seen the intro, which is beautifully done again. I'm going to pick the Skia. <clears throat> I'll read the background. Your story began long before you came into this world, when your relatives escaped the watery grip of sticks through unknown means to start a new life on the surface. The call of the shadows, however, is inescapable for a half-blood like you. It swells in you like a deafening melody, calling you home, back into the sea, to the place that the light can't reach, into sticks. Whispers your mind can't decipher plague you, but your soul remembers. You've been able to forget that you aren't necessarily in sticks of your own free will. However, you'll need to wake up soon and start asking questions before the deep starts to consume you. Settling into a new city can be a real headache. Okay, let's get into it. Um, Angel will be my ski and eh? Uh, an Angel... What did I do earlier? I have no idea. Mm, I'm thinking of a name. Angel. Angel. Sky. I don't know. She, her pronouns. Doesn't matter. My last name does not come up. At least in the demo. At least based on last time. I need to try and stay awake. Not an easy feat when exhaustion is tugging at the edge of my mind. The only thing keeping my eyes open being the whirring of the ribbon of my trusty typewriter as my fingers move mindlessly over the keys. Well, that and the sound of my boss, Penelope Sinclair, rustling around in her new office, or in her office, a few steps away. 
Occasionally, I hear the clinking of glass, too, of drink after drink being poured. I gather she's having a rough night, too. There's been plenty of those around here lately. I glance at the clock and register that it's barely seven. The boss is going to have one hell of a hangover tomorrow. Again. I stare at the sad, solitary line I've managed to type up in the last half hour, wondering, wondering that if I look long and hard enough, will the rest of the transcript just manifest? That doesn't happen, of course, but it does make me realize I've made a spelling error. Frustrated, I tear the paper out of the roller and crumple it up, tossing it in the direction of the nearby trash can. I miss because of course I do. I start fresh, typing the same old words, words I could probably type out in my sleep with my hands tied behind my back at this point. Missing. Kidnapped. Presumed dead. Dismembered. Grim stuff, but it's our new, harsh reality, and seemingly the norm here in sticks lately. I try not to fixate too much on the names and the, and the details, but there's a low whistle behind me. Hey, you done yet? I thought you were supposed to be fast. I don't have all night, you know. I picked, I picked the skier, right? This seems like the... Yeah, okay, I'm pretty sure this is not the same. Sorry, boss. I feel a pinch of guilt when I take stock of the ever-growing bags under her eyes. Things haven't been going well for poor, hard-working Penny as of late, and in turn, that means things aren't going well for me either. Sorry, boss. I'll finish up as fast as I can. I get a view of the tense, rigid lines of her shoulders before she vanishes out of sight, and that's when the guilt truly creeps in, taking frustration's place. Scott and Sinclair's investigation. Scott and Sinclair investigations. The door to her office declares, but it's been missing the Scott for a few weeks now, namely Annie Scott, Penny's partner in solving crime, and one of the unlucky citizens who went missing recently. I don't think Penny's caught a wink of sleep since. My relationship with my pillow has been on shaky terms recently, too. Thanks to the amount of work that seems to be piling up and piling and... Huh. Shaking my head. I press play on the tape recorder and get ready to type. But what did you see? You say you blacked out after she was taken. You must have caught a look at the guy's face. That's the thing, though. That wasn't no guy, wasn't no human. Yeah, you said that already. But it isn't like we have much in the way of humans down here. So, help me out. Be more, be more specific. It wasn't one of them, either. It was... I switch off the tape just in time for the rumbling that gently rattles my desk to intensify. The light overhead swings and flickers dangerously, and my glass of water jumps closer to the edge of my desk. I just barely manage to grab it in time. The quake stops abruptly. Is it me, or did that one feel more violent? Penny has, re Penny has reappeared amidst the unwelcome distraction. She stands in the doorway, tugging on a pair of well-worn heels, her coat draped under one arm. She looks unconcerned that the ocean floor just shook us like a fish, like the fish in a bowl that we are. Something like that. She squints at me. I suppose you might be a little less bothered than us humans, huh? Your sea legs are surely sturdier than mine. Oops. I wouldn't go that far. Still getting used to being back, and it's not like my memories of this place are crystal clear. I'd see that as a blessing. Besides, nothing can send six tumbling. With a sigh, Penny <clears throat> With a sigh, Penny seems to reconsider her statement. Well, not from the outside, anyway. Smirking mirthlessly, Penny grabs her coat. She strides towards the door, towards the door with purpose clearly not interested in hanging around to wait for me to finish. Go home and rest when you're done with that one. 
I need you here bright and early tomorrow. Understand? Oh, and lock up for me, will ya? And then she's out of the door. And then she's out of the door and disappearing into the early evening atrium crowds before I can even think about responding. I hear the familiar soft flick of her lighter before her footsteps resume and fade away. Now that I'm officially alone with my transcription, I pinch the bridge of my nose and hunch over my typewriter once more. Almost there. Just think about climbing into bed. Then it happens again. Shake, rattle, roll. Another quake. This time it's like a hammer slamming against fragile glass, the entire room shaking with the force of it, and rattling me so hard I nearly fall out of my chair. I hear something shattering, not sure if it's in here or outside, but I don't stick around to find out. I need to go. With my heart in my throat, I stumble for the door, trying desperately to remember what I'm supposed to do in case of a quake. This fucking city. Out in the atrium, I stumble into utter pandemonium. Panicked people flood the avenue, pouring from the shops, a loud and anxious river swimming under the local establishment's bright neon lights. There's a stampede of them moving in the direction of the exit to the other areas of the city, and it feels like the world is about to end. I look up at the ceiling and the murky seabed outside, expecting to see cracks forming in the thick glass. Is this it? I've barely been here a month after the, all the dreams and nasty little whispers that lured me back, and this is how it ends. Then I feel a shadow looming over me. Not a physical shadow, nothing that I can see, hear, or touch, but I know it's there. I feel it there, a something pressing closer, closer. For one dizzying moment, I look out beyond the glass windows and feel as though the currents of the sea are running deep in the marrow of my bones and swirling beneath my skin. I feel them churning and crashing, my heartbeat scattering into the low roar of the thousand tons of water pressure. My ears are blocked, my veins run icy, but still, I hear it. I hear them. I hear them all, clearer and sharper than ever. There's that absence of sound, a heavy emptiness, that familiar nothing, and then everything, as my whole world, fades to black. Then, a flash. Oh, this is something different from the vision before, when we were a human. Wow, I'm scared. Somewhere in my mind, I can see a window. One not too unlike those in the atrium, but in front of it lies a figure in a comfortable-looking bed. The shadows of the ocean cast them in a gentle green-blue light, and I'm caught by how beautiful they are. Dark hair that falls in waves over the smooth, freckled skin of their shoulders. Their lashes long where they flutter against sleep flushed cheeks. Their chest heaves as they toss and turn and pant. I'm transfixed. Look away. I will my mind to turn away, my eyes close tight as I try to focus on something other than this stranger that apparently sleeps before me. I seek out the voices that are more familiar to me than those that linger here, voices that call out to me with their gentle song, seeking mine in return. Instead, I'm met with something else entirely. A symphony. No, one voice. Deep and rich. A sermon. A prayer. Something terrible and desperate and intoxicating that involves an unmistakable sense of danger. Oh my gosh, that was so scary. I did not expect that. It awakens a restlessness inside me. Something that has been building alongside all of the promises that the voices who whisper to me in dreams have made. Promises of a better world. Of a savior. Of paradise. But then it gets too loud. I cover my ears and will it to go away, feeling like if I let it in, then it'll gut me and leave me hollowed out and raw. Oh, it's Adrian from before. But we don't know it's Adrian. When I open my eyes, the figure before me is still present. They shoot up bright, sweat beating at their brow, and then they're looking right at me. Like this isn't a dream or a vision. 
or whatever the hell seems to take hold of me when I let the whispers in. No, this is very real, and I feel the weight of that reality as I am pinned in place by golden eyes. I let my hands fall to my side, that voice nothing but a terrible memory, and I stare right back. Who are you? Um, I don't know. I mean, I know who I am, but I don't know who you are. Before, <clears throat> Before I can respond, the shadows consume me, and I'm bathed in darkness once more. Okay, that's intriguing. Hmm. That's a different vision, which makes sense, since we are a skia rather than a human. I wake early and I don't remember how I got home, but I do know that my sleep was fitful and plagued with nightmares. I would say that was nothing new, but these were different. That voice sticks with me, haunts me, and the whispers that were once nothing but a quiet, friendly call are now deafening. Like a death knell, like something's trying to stifle them, and all they can do is scream. It's a beautiful day here in Styx, or so we are all told today, and every other damn day, by the daily morning announcement. It blares across all of Styx, gaslighting you into thinking there's nothing to worry about. No sea of people fearing for their lives after another earthquake. No nightmares driving you insane. No disappearances that only two burnt-out people are bothering to investigate. Maybe I should have called out today, after all. The clock on the wall declares it's half past nine. I've been in my chair, turning the recorder off and on for the past thirty minutes, but nothing coming out of those tapes is sticking in my mangled mind. The piece of paper sitting in my typewriter stares up at me tauntingly, still as white as snow. I wish my thoughts were the same, but instead, I'm replaying what I saw last night over and over until I feel sick. I've lived with visions all my life, and those like me who live in secrecy on the surface have a pretty way of putting it. They say our parents or grandparents carried the sea with them when they walked out of the waves to join those up there, and that the sea never leaves us. Its currents flow in our blood, its whispered secrets beckoning us to return. In a way, I suppose it's comforting. No matter where I go, no matter what might have happened to me up there, I always had a home to return to. Here in Styx, surrounded by the ocean's tumultuous darkness, the vision yesterday was sharper and more real than anything I've ever experienced before. So much so, I think I almost lost myself in it. How long have you been back in Styx, then? Is it the same timeline as when you're the human? I came here because I could no longer resist the call. Much like how the pure-blooded sirens charm others, the sea charms us. Will I one day dissolve into sea foam and memories among the waves? A knock on the door halts the spiraling of my thoughts. Jerking to attention, I instinctively get up to answer it. It can't be Penny. I am sure I heard sounds coming from our office, and nobody is scheduled to visit. It swings open before I can reach the handle, and before me stands a tall, broad-shouldered, and bespectacled, bespectacled, Bespectacled. Bespectacled. <laughs> Man. <laughs> I can say the word bespectacled. 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 Bespectacled man. <laughs> he, un he adjusts his glasses, looking annoyed, his mouth already half open as though he's going to call out for someone. It's, daughter it's Dr. Shushida. He stops short when he sees me, however, and blinks. Oh, pardon me, I thought. He clears his throat, seeming like he's struggling. He clears his throat, seeming like he's struggling for words, then turns and closes the door instead. There's a brown paper bag clutched tightly in his hand. A delivery for Penny. Can I help you? I didn't think we had any appointments today, but... The stranger smirks. Penelope has appointments now. Only for you, Arch. Penny, Penny emerges from her office, stepping out a half-smoked cigarette in the ashtray on my desk before leaning against it and raising an eyebrow at our guest. It's immediately obvious that they know each other, and while Penny isn't exactly smiling, she seems relaxed. Well, as relaxed as Penny can be, anyway. 
Angel, meet Dr. Archimedes Shushida. He's an acquaintance of mine. I was going to tell you I was expecting him, but I didn't think we'd be expecting him quite this early. Well, well, what do you know? Having my entire clinic wrecked by drunks picking fights after I spent effort stitching them up put me in the mood to go through my old recordings. A welcome distraction. He turns to me with a dashing smile. And please, just call me Archie. Okay. Hi, Archie. Oh, CG! Smiling, Penny shoves her hand towards him, her palm upturned and her fingers wiggling impatiently as she awaits the offering that the doctor has brought her. Archie holds out the brown paper bag, teasingly keeping it just out of reach as he turns to me and gives me an apologetic look. You're her new hire, right? I am sorry for bringing you more work. It makes no difference at this point. Just add it to the pre-existing mountain. Hey, come on now, Angel. Aren't you ecstatic about having something to keep you nice and busy? The mischievous glint in her eyes is very telling. You're doing a very good job of that already. Penny, Penny smirks at me, then snatches the bag and empties the content onto her desk like a child eager to open presents on Christmas morning. I spend the mi minute she takes sorting through them to study Archie further, but I'm quick to discover he has the same idea when I find him looking right back. It's nice to meet you. Likewise. There's a moment of awkward silence on my part, mostly. Archie nods politely, but he's borderline staring, his gaze curious and sharp. I feel like I'm being studied. Instinctively, I drop my gaze. I have a feeling I know what he's looking at. My eyes. A dull, honeyed yellow. A siren's trait, the most visible and unmistakable sign of the half of me that isn't human. Ah, sorry. That was rude of me. Eh, you're not the first to do it though it's a lot less of a problem here than elsewhere. Like on the surface, I want to say. The one good thing about being in sticks is that I'm no longer some anomaly or pretty freak. There are plenty like me here. Golden eyes staring in from behind the city's glass windows, or the brighter ones worn on very normal-looking human faces, smiling at me as I walk down the street. I rub the back of my neck awkwardly, I've looked away out of habit. Nothing good happens when the people back home start staring. But I'm not home anymore, am I? Oh, that's true, though. That must be something. There must be some comfort to be in sticks, then. Even though it was kind of a... A push to do... To move from the surface to sticks. And also, you're a human, still. Like, you're half... Like, you grew up on the surface. Well, Angel, you'll be happy to know that at least they're all labeled. Penny Penny finishes her assessment of the goods, and with pursed lips, she hands me a tidy stack of tapes. They're bound together by twine, and there's a note in flowing handwriting tucked under the string, listing what I assume is the details of the contents. You looking to hire another transcriber? Please say yes. Penny scowls at me. Good luck finding someone who wants to get involved with the rat with this mess right now, friend. In fact, I was worried you would ignore my request, Archie. You were quiet for so long. Ignore you? After you've barely acknowledged my correspondence, unless I delivered it in person for months? Admittedly tempting. Hey, I've been busy. This is... She, ge she gestures at my desk, the tapes, everything in general. Those stress lines are appearing on her face again, tight around her mouth. A fucking mess, as you can imagine. Don't suppose you've got any information about our newest mystery. Penny looks at the corkboard, off to the side. And Archie drifts closer to it. I only need to follow her gaze. She flicks the poster, leaning against the wall with a resigned sigh before she addresses me. Okay, this is information about Egan Castor again. Same information. Oh, wow. I do like his shirt, though. He does look so different from Blue. I mean, they look the same, obviously, because they're twins, but, like, his persona is just so different. Like, he looks more, he seems more laid back and probably would, it seems like he'd have a lighter vibe in terms of, like, energy and, like, more go with the flow. And Nana has a, 
a bit of a Debbie Downer, I feel like Blue is. But, you know, I do like Blue. So that's not to say I'm complaining. I'm just saying that they're different. Stark contrasts between them. Name is Egan Castor. His brother came to my apartment after the quake in a mad panic. Said he disappeared last night under suspicious circumstances. But that's all I managed to get out of the crazy bastard before he ran off. Men. Archie huffs a laugh, implying that he agrees with her, before he turns relatively serious. Your guess is, good as, is as good as mine. I was probably one of the last people to talk to him before he went missing, apart from his brother. But other than seeming like he was in a terrible hurry, he said nothing else. You had direct contact with him before he disappeared. Archie shrugs, looking pensive. Penny only frowns, but she doesn't push, nor does she seem in a hurry to press him further. Though Archie takes a deep breath and offers clarification freely. Maybe it was my glare that did the trick. He comes by my clinic occasionally. Charming guy, but he remains a mystery to me despite having known him for a while now. Always anxious and rushing about. Just type lift about everything. I didn't have time to talk to him because he will never let me have that time. Sounds like Egan. Always charming in his way out of actually saying something of substance despite clearly not lacking brain cells. And now he's gone, it would appear. Penny's lips press into a thin, razor-sharp line. After a moment, she sighs. There's just too many moving parts that we can only see ha ever see half of, if that. She pauses, then turns to me with a frown. You know what? Take the day off if you want. I'd like to give these tapes a listen before you transcribe them. And I need to think about reorganizing the priorities of the work I've given you with Egan's is disappearance cropping up. This one feels significant. You two, sh you two should both take a break. Doctor's orders? I wouldn't dream of trying to order an investigator around in her own office, Miss Sinclair, but it is my recommendation. Penny, sm Penny smiles, just a tiny one, but it's there. I'd better head back in case I have patients waiting. Nice to see you both. I hope I never have to see either of you in my clinic. I wouldn't be caught dead there. You never saw rum. Please don't use rum as medicine. From his pocket, Archie produces a business card. This he hands to me. Okay, nice. What was it you just said about not wanting to see either of us there? I said I hope I won't have to. In these times, though. Archie shrugs helplessly. For a moment, he looks pensive, as though he's going to say something else. <laughs> Why not flirt with Archie? <laughs> I flip the card in my hand, considering it for a moment. Business only? Or are you open to less formal visits as well? Uh, that depends on the nature of whatever you're trying to discuss. Penny laughs. Don't bother, Angel. He never stocks anything worth a visit in his cabinets. It's always just those bitter elixirs. Now, get lost, Yoshida. Bye! With a wink and a final smirk, Archie sees himself out. I wait until the door is closed and his footsteps are gone to speak. Nice guy. He's a bit annoying, but overall, yeah. Now, what are you waiting for? For me to change my mind about letting you off early? I grab my coat and head for the door before she can even finish her glare. Bye, Penny. <clears throat> what are we going to do today? Are we going to go see some more people? As I wander through the atrium aimlessly, there's a shop that catches my eye. It does this every time I pass this way for reasons I can't begin to unravel. This small, gimmicky-looking fortune-telling hub nestled between Sykes Love Casino and Aphrodite's Beauty Salon. The Killing Moon in its, si its sign announces with a gracious flor graceful flourish. Its colorful window is chock full of charms, oddities, and various posters insisting that Incredible Eve, the Incredible Eve, can tell me my fortune and what I ate for breakfast. 
I lean in to get a better look at one of those flyers. Okay, same flyers as before. Right. It does draw you in. I'll give the owner that. Yet, I can't shake the feeling that there's more to it than just the whimsical display that calls for my attention. Before I can fully control myself, my hand is already on the shop's doorknob. And then, I'm inside. Will we meet Adrian here? I don't I think that would be too easy. The bell above the door jingles to announce my entry, and a powerful wave of incense and the smell of it, at least half a dozen scented candles assaults my nose. The music that plays quietly on a record player in the corner is strangely nostalgic, and the door clicks shut behind me. I step forward, my eyes drawn to the shelves, full of trinkets and gleaming crystals, their bright colors drawing me in. You're a curiosity, aren't you? More precious than any in this shop. And look, the ties have washed you right in. I nearly jump out of my skin as a figure appears seemingly out of nowhere. I sense their gaze and after I hear their voice, their eyes blue and piercing and bright. Then I see the rest of them, a wispy figure dressed in all white with a cascade of red hair, a slim face and slender hands. If I didn't know any better, I'd think I'd bump right into a ghost. The stranger smiles at me. Their expression dreamy if not for their unnervingly curious eyes. Looking for anything in particular, stranger? Oh, no. Just looking. They grab a crystal off the closest shelf and cradle it in their palms. Their long light eyelashes flutter as they lean in, whispering to it. Here, Jet. If you ever feel like you might float away, this will keep you grounded. They lean in and put their hand to their mouth as if they're about to spill a secret, their voice a whisper. Good for curses, too. Curses? Are you done wasting my time? Oh. <clears throat> Are you done wasting my time, Eve? It's blue! <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Sorry, I, I knew I had a feeling we wouldn't see Adrian here because that'd be too easy. But it's blue! Hello, blue. So weird to see you in such a brightly lit store in space. The new voice echoes coldly around the shop. I look up and find the source of it standing with his arm crossed by the counter, a scowl firmly fixed on his pale face. He looms, his presence almost oppressive. There is something oddly and eerily familiar about him, though I can't tell from where or how, and he doesn't give me time to consider. As though sensing my attention, the man turns and frowns at me. At this point, the shopkeeper, Eve, also whirls around to face the rude guest, the shiny black rock still in their clutches. Enough of that, Blue. It's already a misfortune that you came into my shop. Now you're chasing my customers away with that face? The gall of it. I was here first. And? You're not buying anything, are you? This blue sneers, his lip curling back over perfect white teeth. I'm positive he's some kind of ghost or demon himself, the strange black tattoos that bind over his strong forearms and strong forearms disappear under the sleeves of his pretty shirt, sure looking like a bad omen. It's interesting that we get to see the, the, the marks, the black marks on his forearms now rather than obviously later. I'm not about to be tricked into purchasing your overpriced garbage, no. But I would would still appreciate you having the courtesy to finish our conversation before you move on to your next victim. I watch Eve's fingers flex around the rock and wonder for a split second if they might turn it into a projectile. But then they shake their head and gesture as though motioning for silence and turn back to me with a sweet coy smile. Sorry about that. As I was saying, Jet, yes, this might help you with your little problem. They slip the stone into my hand. How do you know about... I glance desperately at Blue. He's been rude, but at least he distracted the shopkeeper for their hard sell for a second there. He mumbles something under his breath, and I notice how stark the dark circles under his eyes are, a flash of macabre purple against pale white. 
I wonder when the last time he bothered to sleep was, if he bothers at all. Does anyone get a good night's sleep here in the city? Save the dead? I'd put, the I'd put it back on the shelf with the rest of them if I were you, stranger. There are more useful rocks in the ocean. Eve purses their lips. I enjoy rude men who overstay their welcome in my shop just as much as you enjoy my useless trinkets, Mr. Castor. Perhaps a banishing crystal will suffice. Maybe ten to get rid of the likes of you. Blue's mouth twitches in brief amusement. Then he snorts and pushes past us, our shoulders brushing for a split second. My world darkens and tilts. I hear the muted rumbling of undersea waves and a dull cry that could be a voice or something far worse. Something unfathomable and ancient and terrible. It reminds me of what I felt last night when I gazed upon the stranger in my vision. I blink and he's gone, like he was never even there. Never even here. A dark void left in his place. Eve claps in her hands and breaks me from my daze. Aha! Uh -huh. The banishing crystals work. What did I tell you? I force a smile, though even I can feel that it's shaky and unconvincing. Eve rests a cool palm against my forearm. Hey, are you okay? You look like you've seen a ghost. Who the devil was that? Eve snorts and uncovers her mouth with a dainty hand, their gaze apologetic. Pardon me. He's no one. No one at all. I find it hard to believe them. Eve squints and leans in like they're trying to see more of me. Closely. A little uncomfortable, I lean away. After a moment, the shopkeeper hums and straightens. They put their hands behind their back and close their eyes, tilting their head as though listening to something. Okay. This is going from weird to frightening. Can I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. That man, you called him Mr. Castor. The, Mr. Post the missing poster flashes through my mind. Archie mentioned a brother, didn't he? Yes, I wish people weren't quite so fascinated with him. He's a load of trouble, you know. All jagged edges and wood splinters. The type of human that will cut you if you stand too close. But like divers risking down, drowning to find their treasures in shipwrecks. Eve sighs gustily and shrugs, holding up their hands. Do you know where he's going? I might have some questions for him. So much for my day off, but maybe I could, if I can head off this investigation, it might give us a new lead. His brother and Penny's partner won't find themselves. No, and I quite like it that way. Eve begins to wave dismissively, then pauses. They consider me for a heartbeat with pursed lips. I can't tell what they're thinking. Before I can ask, however, Eve sighs and ducks behind the counter. But I know you're not going to leave it alone, are you? I can tell you're not the type. So here, consider this a new customer welcome gift. They hand me a card. Huh? Okay. Why did we get Adrian's card, then? Who is this? The one person closest to that mysterious Mr. Castor, probably. Adrian's teeth are sharper, but at least they won't bite. They seem to reconsider the statement. Well, not unless you ask nicely, of course. And what will this cost me, exactly? Oh, that's free. The city's already teeming with ghosts, you know. I would rather not add yours to my conscience. Eve smiles beatifically. All right, then. They can keep their secrets, I suppose. Though maybe it's poor manners to leave without buying something now. The jet, how much is it? Hmm, you know what? You can keep that, too. Now you're being suspiciously generous. Pay me back with another visit. How about that? I see you walking past my shop a lot, you know. You must work close by, so drop in. 
Eve smiles wider. I smile back, a little uncertainly. Then I draw, look down at the address on the business card again. The name sounds familiar. I don't know from where or, or what, but it feels like a long-forgotten morsel of knowledge. And if it really will help me find this mysterious other caster, I'll have to take it. Thank you, Eve. Mm-hmm. Come again. Wow. Okay, so that was a much nicer encounter with Eve than before. Um, so that's really nice. I'm going to keep everyone in suspense, and I am going to stop here for the day and look forward to another part of the demo, um, the second part of this demo. Um, and yeah, let me know what your thoughts are. Um, so far, do you think you would want to choose being a human or a skia? Um, let me know. Also, looking at these paintings, it's they're like mostly a blue, it seems, or at least a, a good like a few, like at least two of them, and there's lots of blue in general in this space, which I love. Blue is a favorite color of mine. Um, but yes, I'll be back with another part soon. Um, I hope you all have a re good rest of your day, and I'll see you next time. Bye!